Everyone in this room has at least one thing in common. No matter where you're from, or what you do, or why you're here, no one here has ever lived in a world without Triceratops. <laughs> Since it was first named in 1889, Triceratops has gone on to become one of the most well-known animals that has ever lived on this planet. Today, it can be found not only in museum displays around the world, but also in movies, television shows, video games, books. I first met Triceratops in a children's book when I was very little growing up in New York, and I remember being amazed by the pictures of this strange horned creature that looked something like a cross between a rhinoceros and a lizard and a parrot. Some people today might suggest that an animal which has been extinct for over 65 million years, and which has been the subject of study for well over a century, would have nothing left to teach us. But actually, we're learning new things from Triceratops every day, and a large part of this ongoing research is taking place right here in Bozeman at the Museum of the Rockies. In 1999, the museum spearheaded a huge multi-institutional endeavor, an exploration of the badlands of eastern Montana, focusing on what's known as the Hell Creek Formation. And the Hell Creek Formation is the geologic unit that represents the very end of the age of dinosaurs in Montana. It's where you find animals like Tyrannosaurus rex and Pachycephalosaurus. But by far, the most commonly recovered dinosaur in the Hell Creek is Triceratops. If you walk out into the badlands of eastern Montana, it's only a matter of time before you come across a Triceratops spilling out of a hillside. When I first came out to Montana State University to start my graduate studies, I told my advisor, Jack Horner, that I was interested in how dinosaurs evolved. And Jack said, well, if that's what you want to work on, you're going to need to work with an animal that we have a lot of. And we have a lot of Triceratops. In just the last few years alone, we've collected well over 50 new specimens, ranging in size from tiny little juveniles all the way up to huge adults with skulls the size of cars. And there's a whole range of growth stages between these two extremes, so now it's possible to study the details of how Triceratops changed as it grew up from a baby to an adult. That's called ontogeny growth and development. Those are the kinds of changes you might notice in people and other animals around you. And if you wake up and look in the mirror every morning, you might notice changes in yourself from day to day to day as you get older and older and older. But it can be a bit more difficult for us to notice evolutionary changes occurring around us. Say, for example, you spend your entire life living in a single town, say Bozeman. Over the course of your whole life, you might notice some new buildings going up downtown, maybe some old buildings being renovated and taken down, roads being constructed, maybe some new, some new restaurants show up in town, but very rarely, if ever, Will you look around yourself and notice dramatic changes in the shapes of the plants and animals around you over the course of your life, so much so that by the time you're much older, these might now be considered different species than they were when you were younger. But in paleontology, those are exactly the kinds of changes that we can see, because we're working with geologic time, time you can walk up and down. And by that I mean, when you go out into the Hell Creek and you're surrounded by these hillsides, you can see that these hills are made up of layers of rock. And these layers weren't formed all at once. The ones on the bottom were deposited before the ones on top of them. So as you climb up through the layers of the Hell Creek, you really are climbing up through time, because each layer contains the plants and animals that lived and died in that area over the course of time. And in the Hell Creek, that's over the course of the last one to two million years of the age of dinosaurs. I was very lucky in that when I was just starting out working with Triceratops, there was another graduate student, Denver Fowler, who was starting out at about the same time. And Denver's research focuses, in part, on the stratigraphy of the Hell Creek Formation, the details of the layers of the rocks and how they're related to one another. And so we teamed up, and we spent several years working together, several summers going all throughout the Hell Creek, going to sites where Triceratops was being dug up, and finding new Triceratops ourselves 
and in some cases going to quarries where Triceratops have been excavated decades ago. And at each one of these sites, we tried to determine where we were in time. That is, in which layer of the rocks had this animal lived and died. And as we did this for Triceratops after Triceratops after Triceratops, and combined our findings with those of other members of the Hell Creek Project, we started to notice something interesting. As we went up through the layers of the Hell Creek, all the Triceratops around us changed. The first thing we noticed was that when we were working low down in the formation, in the lower layers, all the Triceratops we encountered had little tiny horns above their noses, their nasal horns. And when we were working up high in the formation, just below where you don't find any more dinosaurs at all, all the Triceratops we encountered had really long, big nasal horns. And as we went from the bottom of the formation up to the top, nasal horns appeared to become more elongate the higher we went. When these specimens were brought back to the lab and fully taken out of the rock that had encased them for millions of years, we studied the details of other bones in the skeletons and noticed other differences between Triceratops found down low in the formation and those found up high. And Triceratops found in the middle of the formation appeared to have a combination of features seen in specimens found below them and above them. And so, based on this evidence, we hypothesized that what we were actually seeing out in the Hell Creek were stages in the evolution of Triceratops through time. And that's a relatively rare thing to be able to see for a dinosaur, because most dinosaur species are only represented by one or a handful of specimens. And in order to study evolution at a fine scale, to really see the details of how one species changed over time into another, you need a large number of specimens from a broad stratigraphic range from throughout the layers of the rocks, and a good understanding of their placement within those rocks. So the fact that Triceratops is so common, and it's common to the point of sometimes you're walking out in the Hell Creek and you find a Triceratops, and then you go on for another minute or two, and then there's pieces of another Triceratops, and then you round a corner and there's another Triceratops. That's exactly what makes Triceratops so important and so exciting, because all these Triceratops together are showing us the details of how this animal evolved, and also how it grew up from a baby to an adult. Even after having spent so much time with Triceratops, I still get just as excited when I see one now as I did when I was a little kid flipping through the pictures in my dinosaur books. However, when I was younger, I'd always kind of thought of Triceratops as being sort of a dinosaur rhinoceros, because they're both big animals with horns. But now, when I think about Triceratops, and I think about animals alive today, the first animal that comes to my mind is a fruit fly. Because very much like Triceratops, fruit flies are very, very common. And you wouldn't think that they would have anything to tell us that we don't already know. But precisely because they're so common, fruit flies are very well studied. And now they're used as a model for studying other animals. By exploring how fruit flies work, we're learning how all animals work, including ourselves. And similarly, by studying Triceratops, we're learning a lot about how other dinosaurs grew up and evolved. So Triceratops demonstrates that every dinosaur fossil, whether it's a beautiful articulated skeleton or just a nasal horn at the bottom of a valley, these are all pieces of the story of life on this planet. They're all important. It's always exciting when someone discovers a new species of dinosaur, something that's never been seen before, something that maybe we couldn't even imagine before they found it. But Triceratops reminds us that just because something is old or familiar or common, that doesn't mean that it has nothing left to teach us. Thanks. <laughs>